Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, I will be talking about graph and gremlins. Um, this, this title of the uh, presentation says about graphs and gremlins, which is the uh, language used to traversing the graphs. But in general, I will start with uh, to by uh, talking to you about uh, graph databases, and then we uh, we uh, go to uh, how to deal with graph databases from the code, and especially how to do how to deal with graph databases from Scala. Um, I'm not sure uh, how many of you have any experience with graph databases whatsoever. Okay, I expected less people actually. So um, the presentation will be uh, I will be using for some parts of the presentation Orient DB, and that's the uh, that's the implementation of the graph database that uh, we are using in the company for some uh, for some of our projects. Um, this is how basically the graph looks like. Right from the in the Orient DB studio. So let's talk about what in general is graph, right? So you have a fancy uh, fancy uh, definition here, and I tried to, tried to highlight some of the points that are uh, of the most interest. And basically, the graph is composed of vertices and edges, and it has labels which can differentiate the type of edge, meaning the type of relationship. And it has some key value properties, so we can think of it as attributes in relational model. Um, in fact, this is this such structure is has its name. It's called property graph. So the uh, graph databases actually implement property graph. The last sentence is actually pretty uh, pretty interesting. Perhaps is the most uh, important part of this definition. So it is directed attributed multi-relational graph. And what does it mean? So the thing is that uh, directed means that's the kind of a decomposition of this sentence. Directed means that any uh, that uh, the edges that can, that are uh, between the vertices have direction, so they have incoming uh, incoming uh, vertex vertex and uh, outgoing vertex. They are attributed, which means that they have key value parts, and that's the, basically the way how you store data in graph database. Uh, Key value parts can be both on vertex and on uh, and on edge, and last but not least, multi-relational, which means that there are different type of relational uh, relations in that uh, relationships in that uh, in the database. So, uh, to reiterate on these uh, on the actors that we have in the uh, in the uh, in this story about graph uh, databases, we have basically vertices, edges, and properties. So for people who don't have any uh, experience with, uh, with graph databases, you can think basically uh, of vertex as a, as a relation, which is basically table in, in a relational database. So that's what keeps your data, uh, data right? Um, there is also an edge. And the closest thing that, that you have to, to edges in the relational model is the power of uh, foreign key and, uh, and, and primary key. So the edge is basically a link right, between two vertices. Uh, edges may or may not have uh, uh, m uh, properties uh, assigned to them, but, uh, but they have labels. And by labels, you differentiate what is the type of the relationship. Like you have the different type of relationship between I don't know, you and your mother, and then you are your colleague uh, in work. right? So the last thing. Oh, and actually, one more thing about that: the the edge itself. It's pretty important uh, in the way how you handle that uh, these edges. I will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, later but that's actually the the thing that differentiates and uh, the graph databases from relational databases, and that's actually the thing that allows all the magic to happen. So the last piece of the definition was property, and as you already know, it's basically an attribute. So. Um, how single vertex can look like in a database? Um, there is actually, I think, some, the name is in Polish, right? Because it's from our, one of the uh, applications that we did in the company. So the application was about uh, cocking stations and, uh, and analyzing, uh, uh, analyzing toxin emission. So basically, uh, you have the, uh, some attributes. And um, for those of you who are familiar with MongoDB, for instance. It looks pretty similar, similar, right? 
So basically, it looks like a document stored in JSON format. So what you have here is some attributes. You also have the uh, indications of outgoing and incoming edges. Actually, here we only have outgoing edges. Yeah, but you can figure out how incoming would look like. It's basically the IDs. Um, there is also some other things that I skipped from this uh, from this slide uh, because uh, there are in in each of these uh, vert uh, vertices there is uh, there are some information that are appropriate that are that are well connected with the uh, how database sort things so it's really database specific. Um, I skipped that for clarity. Um, there is also the attribute which may be interesting, which is the underscore class underscore. I will talk about this later. So, how do you interact when we when we now see how the how the vertices and edges may look like? How do we interact with the uh, with the graph database? So we have a couple of options. Um, we have custom vendor APIs. Actually, that's a language, not an API. It's uh, the language is Cipher in this in this uh, slide. It's the language that is used in Neo4j. Um, we have some libraries uh, like Spring Data, Neo4j, Spring Data, or InDB, or Frames, which is actually part of the Thinkerpop stack. I will talk uh, later. Uh, and last but not least, there is Blueprints and Gremlin. I will be talking about all, only about this. Uh, the reason for that is that the first, uh, the first uh, uh, option, which is Cypher, is really specific to Neo4j, and I wanted to talk about uh, graph databases in general. Uh, Third-party API is really uh, targeted toward Java, right? So you may use it in Scala, but it's well, kind of a, it's kind of a weird, right? It's like using Hibernate in in Scala. Uh, so, and the last thing is frames. Frames is part of the. I will talk about it in, my, in a moment. It's part of the Tinkerpop stack, and it's used for uh, mapping the uh, vertices to objects. So, the Tinkerpop stack is basically a couple of components. There are some huge changes right now uh, going on in the Tinkerpop because it's being transitioned from the version th 2 to version 3 and all those projects are being taken uh, together so there will be one Tinkerpop project that's, uh, instead of uh, those projects that I listed here. But in general, you have blueprints and this is, you may think of blueprints as, uh, well, basically as JDBC in relational database. So it's kind of a specification and implementation that if database will uh, uh, implement this, all the others uh, blocks that are here uh, could be also applied to such database. So uh, I will be talking about blueprints, there will be something about pipes, and there will be Gremlin, which is the language used for traversing the graph. Um, so here is how it looks. As, you, as I said, it's basically it's everything works on top of blueprints. So uh, uh, let me now show you the uh, example. So I will show you the example that is uh, that is uh, using pure blueprints in uh, in code. Uh, right. So. Uh, that's again. That's basically implemented with use of OrientDB uh, as uh, as an in-memory mode. So it's basically attached as a jar to this uh, this project. You may download it from the uh, from the GitHub, and it, sh it should work right away. Um, so you have a graph objects. I needed to initiate the graph, and I did it in a in a trait that is the basic trait for this specification. So we have basic. Uh, features like uh, you can add a vertex, obviously, you can say what the properties of the vertex are, and you need to do some not nice conversions because it's the API tower uh, the targeted basically to Java. So you may add a couple of vertex vertices, uh, you may update the properties, you may add edges between different vertices, you may say that this edge is uh, of have particular label, so that it has some meaning. So this is this sample is about sending emails, right? You have a people and you have uh, emails and you can send an email and you, the email can be set to sent to someone or CC to someone. And here you have some things. That was how you store the data. Here you have some samples how you extract the data. Keep in mind that those samples are really are really something that are used only exemplary, right? So. Um, performance of that will be terrible, right? So 
we'll we'll deal with that in the, in some uh, samples in a, in a moment. So what I'm do doing here, I'm just grabbing all the vertices that have name equals Mike, and yeah, and here I have uh, uh, I'm grabbing some properties from these from these retrieved vertex, and I can remove it. So it looks I think pretty straightforward, right? The problem with that that it's basically treating the uh, graph database uh, graph database uh, vertices. It, it uses it treats them kind of like map, right? You have a back with uh, with properties, and it's uh, it's not very uh, it's not very fun to deal with uh, with such uh, uh, such constructs, right? Uh, here we have another example how you can traverse edge edges. Again, that's Mm, terrible from the performance perspective it's terrible right because as you can see I'm uh, getting the all the managers from the database and uh, then I'm doing getting all the all the uh, emails that they have that, that they sent and then I go get all the uh, the people to whom the uh, the email uh, were sent so at the end I have the name and, I, and I, at the end I get the name of this of these people, so I have the uh, the names of all the receivers of emails sent by managers, right? Right. Okay. So let's skip uh, get back to the presentation. That was how pure uh, vanilla Blueprint API is. Uh, it looks like. Let's think about for a moment uh, about the data graph database and uh, uh, how it's composed of. So as you saw. Uh, it's basically the blueprint uh, basically treats every uh, every vertex in the database as as a map. In fact, you can treat the database, the graph database, as a bag of heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous vertices that are being all put together in one place, right? So it's kind of like you'd have MongoDB with one collection and everything put there. So there's no schema. Uh, and everything is one place. And in fact, what I'm saying right now is both true and untrue depending on the implementation. Like, for instance, OrinDB is very flexible in that. So you can have both schema-less uh, schema uh, database. And it's like here. You can see here, uh, that's again an example, one, uh, example from one of our applications. You can see here that you have, uh, that you have a node uh, you don't basically know what this uh, what this vertex in the middle uh, in the center is, but you can already see that the links that are there, like scenario factory, uh, and there are a couple of background emission and things like that, that actually indicate from the logical point of view that these are different vertices, right? But you can't say that from this from this image because well they look all they all look the same. If we drill down to the properties of those uh, of those vertices, obviously they would have different properties because they are um, they are of different class. So let's now see how you can deal with that in a more fancy way. So first thing, deal with that in a, in a more um, Scala-like way, and on the other other hand, try to keep uh, the domain objects that you have in the in, in the logic of your application and how you can. Uh, Understand and uh, communicate with the database with use of those of those classes instead of uh, plain maps. So another sample is right. So this this example it's is using the project that is uh, it's called Blueprint Scala. And it's basically the wrapper on top of blueprints that allows you to interact with uh, with uh, blueprints, any blueprints enabled uh, database in more Scala 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 like way. So um, what I'm doing here, uh, actually, I created a simple class that will help me with some things. But as you can see, it's really really straightforward. I have save methods, read, delete, final, and get linked. There's nothing more. And I'm doing only this because. Uh, uh, it will help me to. Uh, it will help me with. Uh, with uh, after, for instance, after I operations like safe and things like that, it will convert all those objects again to case classes, not vertices. So, as you can see, I have a couple of entities. These entities are here. Uh, we'll focus on that basically, God and Realm. So. This sample is basically we have gods and they may be attached to particular realms, like we have Chinese realm and basically those are ancient ancient gods. And we have what we need to do 
is we need uh, we need to extend the uh, the entity or that we want to store inside the uh, graph database. Uh, we need to extend the particle class. Class this class is actually ID uh, DB object, but uh, I did my own uh, I my own class because I needed to specify the the type of the ID which is specific to particular implementation of the database. So. Um, What we have here is we can use our case class, we can create, we can set some properties uh, together while instantiating the case class, we can save it to database and we do a couple of, of these operations more, we can find all the, uh, of all the uh, vertices of a given type and we can verify that it all works as, as we expect. Um, what's more, we can, there is a sample that, uh, that uh, that we do deleting of these uh, that is used to do deletion of the created uh, of the created uh, entities and the next sample which is pretty pretty interesting i think uh, is uh, creating the edges between between different uh, different entities in a database so as you can see, as you can see i create a realm and I create uh, a god and i may uh, i created my own method to 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 check whether something is connected to whether there is an edge between uh, between a vertex and a, and a given class of, uh, of entity. So I'm actually trying to figure out if there is anything, any god connected to Hindu realm. So as you can see before I save, there is no uh, no relationship. Then I add the relationship. This is also the kind of a fancy uh, notion that is added to notation that is added by uh, Blueprint Scala. So you can basically uh, create edges between different vertic vertices uh, with this notation. It's pretty nice, right? And it's pretty compact. Uh, and I also, uh, what I can also do is I can chain creation of these, like here, I can chain creation of those, uh, uh, of those edges between vertices to the infinity, right? Uh, so what I did here, I, I have a, uh, I think, Chinese dragon which is, uh, which is uh, linked with Chinese real realm. And then on the other side, I, cre I created a, another dragon god and uh, connected with, with Chinese realm. Um, you can also do things like, you can also create mutual edges, which is basically the, uh, the two vertices, they have mutual edges if, uh, if one edge is, uh, uh, if one vertex has con uh, edge to another vertex and the another vertex has the edge to the, to the previous one. So we have, they have two edges. We can do it with, with notation like this. Right, uh, that's basically all that, uh, that Blueprint Scala allows you to do. So it makes you dealing with, uh, you're dealing with uh, vertices, uh, vertices that are presented as maps uh, a little bit nicer, right? Because you can operate on case classes instead of, uh, instead of pure uh, maps. But that was all pretty simple and it didn't really uh, show you the strength on the uh, graph databases. So now we'll uh, go to the, I think that's the most, uh, that's the kind of a game changer for, uh, for graph databases. That's why there are some uh, usages in the, for graph databases that, uh, that can be more beneficial than, uh, than relational databases. It's basically called index-free adjacency. So it's all about, uh, how you traverse the, the edges in graph databases. Let's go back to our relational model. So in relational model, if you have an association between two different, uh, two different entities, uh, you basically, uh, like, like here, right? W what you basically have in a database, you have a foreign key, which is the ID of the primary key from the other table, and you perform joint operation. If you like to have uh, like properties on the, on this uh, associated with this connection, what you do probably is you would create uh, another table in between, which would hold all the uh, properties of the uh, connection between those two entities. So uh, that's that's simple example. But what you really have is things like that, right? So you have basically uh, multiple different uh, entities, you have different connections, and for 
even small database, usually, or even a database with small, small schema, small projects, usually you have, uh, I don't know, five, ten uh, different joins that you need to uh, execute before fetching the data for, I don't know, report or, or things like that. Uh, for the bigger uh, databases, usually when you have the, the bigger model, usually have much more of these, uh, of these uh, different connections that you, need to, uh, which you, that you need to deal with. And that basically leads to join explosion, right? You have many, many joins and then performance goes down. And what you need to do is basically you start to denormalize, right? So you try to get rid of, of too many uh, joins that are in the queries. So basically you try to uh, somehow keep all the data together instead uh, putting them into the different tables, which I think is basically wrong because uh, you are kind of uh, dealing with your model in, in such a way that you try, well, it, it should be, uh, probably, it should be segmented into different tables. What you do is basically uh, putting it together from the performance reasons, right? Um, so how it differs in uh, graph databases. So in graph databases, what you have is this, uh, is this index-free adjacency, which means that uh, the link is stored, as you saw before. It's, uh, it's stored, actually, inside the inside the record of the, of the particular vertex, right? So we have this out toxins edge. But that would, wouldn't change anything, right? The thing that changes, uh, that changes this, uh, the performance aspect of that is that the actually this ID is the physical location of the, uh, is the physical location of the, uh, of, the, of the vertex you are referring to. So you may treat basically the traversing in the graph database is kind of a constant uh, operation from the, uh, from the uh, complexity point of view, right? So uh, it doesn't really matter how many vertices you have in your database, right? What matters is basically what you need to do in a graph database basically is to fetch a single uh, vertex and that would be your root vertex from which you will start traver uh, traversing. And as soon as you do that, you go traversing all the edges and you get the data you need. And while you're doing that, you have great performance improvements, right? So graph databases are really, are really slow for uh, finding uh, data in a way like in, uh, in a relational databases when you try to I don't know, filter a table for a particular value of a property. But they, are really, they, they, are re they really shine when you go to, when you fetch a single uh, entity and go traverse from that and collect the data you need. When you think of that, that's actually how most of the applications are uh, are built, right? You go to the, I don't know, when you go to the particular uh, form of application or on the list, you do a queries in context of a given, I don't know, entity, right? Like if when you go for the uh, posts uh, of a user in a, in a f uh, f web forum, you basically are querying all the posts that are associated with that user, right? So we start your, uh, let's say, traversal from the user and then go and try to uh, fetch all the posts that the user created. Um, so, as I said, the, uh, this, uh, this operation of traversing is actually, which is, uh, which is kind of a join, like join in the relational model, is the, 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 the thing that is really fast in graph databases. So, this is kind of a mm, picture showing how you kind of a, mm, the symbol how you should uh, traverse the data. You basically need to pick one point and then like a spider on the web, you, you traverse all the, all the uh, uh, edges between vertices to grab your data. But in order to traverse the data in such a way, you need to have a different language because SQL is not really a good language for traversal. So this language is uh, Gremlin. Um, right. So, um, what I do have here is uh, I populated uh, some data in a, in a database, and what I did again, I took the uh, example with emails and uh, 
and the people who sent emails and received them. So I created uh, some people, created emails, put the edges together. As you can see, I also used some things from the Furnace uh, library, which is part of Tinkerpop. It's basically the library used for different graph algorithms. algorithms. We won't have time to discuss that, but this is one of the examples how to create a community. We have a vertex, we have a uh, different vertices, and we want to put uh, edges between them, and uh, in with specific conditions, right, to create communities and the level how they are linked, how the people inside communities are linked to different communities. Um, that's not really that important because that's how we build the data. Uh, so let's get back to our example. So. Uh, the, the library that is used there is uh, mm, it's, it's called Gremlin Scala. It's a version of Gremlin language targeted towards Scala. So as you can see, I have an example like finding all emails you see from a given user. That's pretty straightforward, right? You have uh, first of all, I'm searching for the for my root. And again, that's not something that you would this part. It's not something that you would do in a normal application, right? Because uh, you don't want to, when you do that, you basically scan the whole database to, to figure out which, uh, which vertex has this uh, property of class equal to our class. That's how, by the way, how Blueprint Scala stores the information which class was, uh, refers to given vertex. Uh, normally what you do is uh, you need to have kind of an index uh, and pick the information from the, your root vertex from that index and then as you he see here, that's correct query, right? We have a starting point, and when you have the starting point, you start all the travels. Travel so what I did here is I fetched the, uh, fetched the vertex by ID, and then I'm saying that I go to figure out which uh, vertices are being connected to this uh, vertex via out, uh, out uh, via sent edge, and then I want to go uh, to the, uh, then at this point, I am on the email vertex, right? And vertex. And here, from the email, I uh, want to find out which emails has been cc'd. And then I'm going back in my in my traversal to the email, and I'm basically getting uh, the results of my of my traversal query. So I found out uh, all the uh, all the uh, all the emails that were cc'd from a given uh, user. More examples like. Uh, here we have again the same story, right? I'm trying to, uh, I'm uh, fetching from the database the root of my traversal, traversal, and now what I, that's more interesting example actually, I'm trying to find out here uh, all the, uh, I'm trying to f find out uh, all, the pe all the bankers that have a relationship with some government officials, right? So I'm here, I'm searching for all the people that have occupation as bunker and save this uh, part of my travel uh, travel so I could get back to it later on in the query. And I'm investigating the, the edge nose, which shows me the relationship, and then I'm doing loop. And this loop is actually kind of cool because it, uh, it goes back here, right, and executes these steps multiple times. So basically you have kind of a recursive query, which uh, which explores all the uh, nose uh, relationships uh, and and searches for all the uh, all the people connect, uh, connected to, to, to my root uh, person uh, which have occupation as government official and I'm at the at the end I'm going back to 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 my uh, label to my uh, uh, person which is basically the results of my query so this query gave you the, uh, all the people that are, uh, that have, uh, that all the bankers that have government official in their, in their network and the distance between them and the, uh, and the government official is not uh, bigger than two. So, um, last example is finding the shortest path and as you can see this basically it's pretty straightforward how to find the shortest path between two people. You have two people, you want to find the shortest path between them, uh, exploring again the nose uh, uh, relationship. And as you can see, this one, it's really straightforward. So you may think how you do that in a, 
and for instance in a relational database it would be a little bit more complicated probably so what you do again I start my uh, start my traversal from a particular person and then uh, that's basically noise right you need to do that in order to to all the types uh, match so you, I mark my starting point as uh, again as uh, with a particular label and I explore the uh, nose relationship and I do loop and I'm stopping my loop of going through the uh, through the relationships if the uh, well the loops goes as long as this is true right so when I find the person that I was searching for I'm stopping the loop right and also in order not to well to hang on the square too long because then it may happen that there will be no connection I'm trying to limit the uh, the depth of the relationship uh, to five levels right because if it if it if it would happen that there will be no connection between those two people uh, we'd end up in scanning all the database right and without any results at the end um, that's uh, that's basically all uh, there are a couple of more things that you can that you can probably investigate on your own that's uh, comparing oh, the Orient DB itself is kind of a huge subject right uh, on top of these uh, on top of these uh, graph databases so you have many different options with actually Orient DB is a database that has is a hybrid DB it has both documents uh, it can store both documents and graphs so it's uh, uh, it's very flexible uh, all this presentation if you'd like to 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 try it out it's actually put on the uh, on the GitHub, you can just download it. The slides are there too. You can download it and play it. Uh, just uh, there's a Gradle wrapper, so you don't need anything actually to start doing with uh, with that. So, questions? Right. Right. Uh, Think of that like uh, whenever you have an application which requires you to go with the uh, traversal. Please. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Figure out uh, like I, I can figure out like I don't know. If you go Facebook and they have even graph search, right? That's basically or LinkedIn, right? In your company. Sorry, <laughs> I'm interrupting you. Right. So mm, my point is that w what I wanted basically to present here is that we used it for a couple of projects that. I think we could successfully uh, we could successfully use for that uh, relational database. But the thing is that, in my opinion, is for that's I I've, I agree that it's a matter of taste. As for me, it's basically uh, this model is much more uh, uh, say reasonable, and as you don't have really any penalty for using it because the. My opinion is that for uh, small to middle-sized uh, middle applications, you can do any kind of applications with graph databases. So obviously, if you, if you have a big applications, which is really huge, you always need to you have some trade-offs and you need to do careful decision what you will choose. But It's just more comfortable for you, right? Excuse me? It, it's just more comfortable for you. Is, is that what you're saying? Y yeah, for okay. normal, normal applications. For, for normal plain application, yes. Then you always need to kind of uh, mm, investigate what are the uh, what are the needs for particular application. Again, as you have traversals and things, and you have uh, hierarchical data, that's basically the model that fits it the best. Many applications you will have like a mix of both uh, numerical data and then sometimes those graph structures do you know of any ways to combine those two can you like uh, combine a postgres database with a graph database in some way that makes it easier for you to handle all right uh, now there will be uh, i guess this i don't really know but i i didn't found anything uh, connected with how you deal with those two pieces of uh, you know of database together because you'd have problem with transactions right you have problems with different models and way different libraries and things so on 
Um, I would be very, very uh, cautious about doing this mixed approach. I know that there are lots of people who are actually uh, tr saying that the mixed approach is the best one. You need to use a couple of different databases for different parts of your applications, whatever suits best given part. But I guess that unless there would be a need, I well, I use one database uh, because I didn't really found anything. I didn't really find anything that would help me to somehow I don't know treat those because what you're asking basically is how to treat those two storages kind of a in a transparent way right so you could I don't think so I don't think that it's well easily achievable right okay the, uh, the yes. La, the last yes last question last question Uh, thanks. So uh, I noticed that in the API of Gremlin, uh, it uses uh, Scala closures, function expressions, and I was wondering whether those run on the side, whether those run in your Scala applications or whether they are somehow compiled using Scala macros and run on the database. Yeah, that's that's actually a good question because that depends uh, on the uh, part of the uh, Gremlin query you are using, right? If you are using those I don't know, loops and filters, you're basically going through uh, in this example in your application, right? So, if you'd like to use it on the server side, you'd probably need to use uh, well. That's the kind of uh, thing that you need to um, figure figure out what uh, what is the I don't know, performance characteristics of a given query. Because if you start the query from a particular, let's say, root, uh, root node, right, root vertex, and then you traverse like, I don't know, 50, 100 vertices, right, to figure out what's the data you need, that basically doesn't make any difference where you, where you have this data. If you're traversing, uh, I don't know, thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of different vertices in your traversal, you'd probably should to execute on the database. But you're right, this actual, this sample, when there was these, uh, when there was these uh, closures, they were actually executed in the application. So. But it's possible to run them on a database. Excuse me? But it's possible to run them in the database. You have a couple of different options. First of all, you may use uh, the uh, database itself to send the query there. You may also use, uh, if the database doesn't uh, support the Gremlin natively, you may have something which is called uh, Rexer. And that's basically the, uh, the application that exposes the graph database as a Gremlin uh, uh, edible graph, right? And then you uh, actually may reuse this uh, these server to execute your query. And then it's executed on server side. So that's the easiest way, basically. But you may do as, as you wish. OK, thanks. Uh, where do I pass this? Keep it. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you.